alternative energy. Really, that's probably the longest conversation you can have in a finance community about it. You don't get proper media attention, proper investment attention to alternative energy. Politicians are not using it more than a marketing campaign. So why should I, a common citizen, be even thinking about it? In fact, it is just like this blank slide over here. There is something good about it right there in the middle, but it still lacks that substance to make it a valid source of electricity. At least that is what I thought until I took a good look at it and I made my research. And I realized that there is actually a great substance to it. And today, I would like to show you that alternative energy is one of the few or maybe the only sustainable path for tropical countries in the, into the future. I would like to show you by first sharing the great fundamentals this technology has for these countries, tropical countries, and then how it can solve six biggest problems of tropical countries, starting with climate change, water scarcity, healthcare, economic development, hot temperature, and food security. At least that is what I would like to do, but because I have certain constraints, I can barely touch the first three. Before I get to the main part of the talk, I, I want to answer a question that I, get, I frequently get when I even mention this topic, which is, if what you're talking about is so great, is so amazing, then, then why don't I hear it from the media? Why aren't investors putting their money into it? Why aren't my friends discussing it over a beer? The answer is simple, corporations. Now, I'm not talking conspiracy here, so please don't give me a tinfoil hat or anti-alien spray. I'm talking about profits. Because profits mean where investor attention is concentrated on. So why don't we together look where the investor's attention is. Here's a table from, from, from Bloomberg that shows world's most profitable companies. Um, it's, th these are Fortune 500 companies. So if you, if you, took, if you took a good look on the top, you would see that world's top two most profitable companies are oil producers. More importantly, 43% of Fortune top 10 profits come from a single source, that is oil. Austria, what's wrong with Austria? Nothing wrong with Austria. This is just, if you consolidate all of Fortune 500 energy companies, you would arrive with this country's GDP. And more, most importantly, less than 1% of it comes from renewable sources. How, how, should, how should that concern me? Let me, sh let me share with you a personal story. I was once on a seminar conducted by a huge offshore oil rig builder. In fact, it is a Singapore company. You would probably guess which company is it by now, but I'm not going to name it. So here's a senior manager giving a brilliant talk on corporate strategy, profitability, and success of the company. And it is followed by a short Q&A session. So I raise my hand, stand up, and ask, your company has achieved tremendous success. It has lowered the cost of offshore oil rigs by so much that you're creating a lot of incentives for investors to pursue that avenue. But don't you think you're cross-subsidizing climate change by doing so? And I expect an answer along the lines of, well, you know, we're creating jobs, we're still doing social investment, so we're good. But the answer, to my surprise, was much, much simpler. The answer was, you're young, aren't you? Indeed, I am. One day, you're going to have children. And it's going to be you, your children, and their generations who will be screwed, not me. So why should I care? <laughs> he has a valid logical point, but what does it point to? It points that it is normal for us as humans, as a community, to choose short-term profits over long-term sustainability. And that was what... Well, that was what I just showed you on, on that graph. So how can the short-termism influence us? How far can it extend? Just look, look at, at this picture. It looks like a blank slide again, but there's Beijing somewhere in there. And while, while, we're, talking, <laughs> while we're talking about it, someone is actually making a living selling bottled fresh air. Now keep in mind thinking it's only possible in a movie. <laughs> this tendency of of fossil fuel love goes on. But it doesn't mean that if we love one child over the other, the other one doesn't deserve attention. It just means that we're overlooking that child. So let's take a good look at that child, which is alternative energy. Here's a graph that sums up cost trends. 
of all major alternative energy sources that do not cause <coughs> environmental hazard. On the top over there you have the most expensive, which is tidal. Over there you have the cheapest, which is onshore wind. And then you have nuclear, solar, and offshore wind somewhere in the middle. So logic will say, you know, let's choose the cheapest one. It's our best bet that could work. But there are a lot of problems with wind energy, starting with wind availability. If we put a wind turbine right outside JCU, would it do any good? Now the next issue is environmental concern. That is essentially wind turbines making a kebab out of birds. <laughs> now I'm a vegetarian myself, so I don't like it. <laughs> and the third one is size. Just look at the size of that thing. In a highly urbanized city, that is not sustainable. So our next best bet if we look at that map, looks like biomass. But actually, because it's based on averages, we have a unique point on this graph where nuclear, biomass, and solar energies have almost equal costs, and I call it the green energy equation. But can we consider cost as a sole decision factor in, the, in, this, in this case? I think we can, because, yeah, better preferences. We, we need to consider other criteria like environmental effects of nuclear power, with a horrifying example of which is Fukushima. And then biomass, which causes deforestation, like in the talk you just saw previously. So then we are left with solar power that looks more or less safe. But how does it stand up against giants of traditional electricity producing, which is coal? I was surprised when I saw this. The National Renewable Energy Laboratory, a respected US body, has made its research. And according to its pessimistic projections, 43% of the United States could be covered by solar panels by 2015. And that would be as cost effective as using coal. And it, this number goes up to 88% in the optimistic projection. What does this depend on? This depends on a sole factor, which is consumer choice. Does the finance community agree with this notion? They do because, although it's not much, but 50% of all new investment into alternative energy in 2011 was made into solar power. How about the scientific community? Well, sun essentially is the biggest potential electricity source for humanity. So why am I standing here and talking about solar power when we actually are concerned about, with life in tropics? Common sense would tell you that there is a lot of sun in tropics, just step outside. And that common sense would be absolutely right, because if you map solar irradiation across the globe, you would see that the bulk of it comes to tropical countries. If, if, if this technology is viable in the US, imagine what it could do for tropical countries. But then again, the question stands, why should we be concerned with solar power? Because of the problems it can solve for us, starting with climate change. Before a certain point in time, climate change and, and the media space for climate change was dominated by climate skeptics. They were calling it climate day, the hoax of the century, you name it. Everything that sounds ridiculous. <laughs> and then 2012 happened, where that sea loss in Arctic Sea was so rapid that no scientist could predict it. It shocked everyone, because it was 50% less than the previous average. Again, why should climate change concern us? Because the greatest danger for, for, from climate change comes to tropical countries. Because of the law of evolution, tropical species have evolved in a very, very narrow temperature range. That is around one degree Celsius. So if the temperature is, is to go up by one degree, it could wipe out majority of species living in tropical countries. Again, why should we bother? Because we have a lot at stake. 50% of all species are living in tropical countries. We could lose them. But more importantly, we have rainforests, which are lungs of the earth. The reason everyone is concerned with them, because they produce 40% of the world's oxygen. If, and if these species are gone, we don't have that 40%. Is this a lot? Well, I think it is. Here's again a graph from IPCC. It has a lot of words. But let me just highlight the main points. First of all, the earth has already warmed up by 0.8 degrees Celsius, and we had eight warmest years. Well, it seems like it stretched along a very, very wide period of time, but it has already been proven that climate change is exponential. 
and it means that we speed up along the way. These are projections by IPCC that show in pessimistic scenarios that we could be ice-free by 2040. And the red is actual observation and it shows that we're way below that pessimistic scenario. So the issue is very, very urgent. It is a problem of today. We need to eliminate fossil fuel emissions. The next problem we could solve is water. Now we all know that we, when we talk about water, yeah, we have, we, we see these horrible pictures that every 15 seconds a child dies from a water-related disease. But when we hear it, we think that, well, it's somewhere in Africa, why should I care? But I want to tell you that it's a big, big wrong stereotype, because the biggest problem with water is right here in Asia, in an area which holds 60% of the world's population and only 36% of the world's reserves. The total population of this area is 4.14 billion people, and we have a 24% water deficit. Well, 24% multiplied by 4.14, I think it's a lot, again. So, yeah, this is a bottle of water, but I call it a bottle of blue gold, because in 50 years, we, we could be standing in this room and fighting over this bottle, this very bottle, and we could be having water futures and trading water over the stock exchange. So I'm going to open it up and have my share. <laughs> and just leave it here. So if the wars of, a, of this century are fought over oil, the wars, the wars of the next century could be fought over water. That's a famous saying by Ibn al Gelbin. I like that very much. Can we change it? Indeed we can. Could you raise a hand if the, changing one toilet over the other would cause a dramatic change in your lifestyle? I agree with that, because it, they're similar, but only on the outside. On the inside, one is air assisted, and the other one is just a normal toilet. And by changing our consumer choices, changing choices in appliances and everyday goods, we can do a lot of good. In fact, my team and I have calculated that we can save up to 41,000 liters of water annually just by using different technology, without sacrificing our comfort. Is this a lot? Well, you can save 800 days of life for a child in a water-deprived country. Each and single one of us can save a life. And again, let me get back. Why, why, should, sol why should we be concerned with this in line with solar power? Because to use these technologies, we need to use more electricity. And we don't, we don't need harming the environment. For, for the opportunity of getting water. We need both good environment and clean water. And to achieve this, we need a renewable source of energy, which is solar power. Am I doing enough myself here? I don't think so, because I have a little sister and we have this table discussions, TED Talks of our own about her future, and she <laughs> says, well, do I need to do this homework? It's useless. Which university should I choose? Where should I go? And I say, you know, just choose whatever you feel like. Choose what your heart tells you. Your future is going to be bright. But then I think, am I telling her the truth? Because she's of that age when, if we do business as usual, she's going to face all that horrible effect of climate change. And I stand here looking in her eyes, and I think I'm like I'm lying, because I'm, I know I'm not doing <coughs> enough to ensure that she has a proper planet to live in. Can any of us go home, look our children in the eye and say that we're doing everything we can to ensure their prosperous future? And the big lesson I've learned from all I said is that nothing nowhere is going to change unless we take specific action to promote that change. And again, let me get back to that graph, please. Because I've talked about it a lot, but there's so much more we can do to enhance our quality of life in tropics with solar power because it can alleviate pains of tropical countries in a financially viable way. And tropics are a great, great place to start that change because of the potential tropics hold. And, and it is a great place in the, it is a place in that, you know, particular need of that change because of the problems it could face in the future. And then again, we need to act now. I know this sounds like a marketing campaign to you, but what I'm marketing here for is actually the planet's future. Thank you.